Welcome back to week three of anatomy and physiology. This is the second of two lectures this week where we'll consider chapter four and the study of tissues. In the first lecture of this chapter, we considered the first two major tissue types in the body, epithelial tissue and connective tissue. These were the bulkiest of topics in our study of tissues. Today, we'll continue with our study of tissues by considering muscle tissue as well as nervous tissue before revisiting some of our lining membranes, mucous membranes and serous membranes, as well as adding coverings to our mix of study that is looking at the cutaneous membrane. We begin our study today with muscle a body tissue that's highly vascularized and responsible for most types of body movement. Whether we're thinking about movement of our body via locomotion or alternatively, movement of substances throughout our body, the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, through the heart, amongst other systems. We have three types of muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle, and we'll discuss each of these three types of muscle momentarily. First, however, let's go ahead and discuss the seven major functions of muscle tissue. First, muscle tissue provides for movement, and I just said it, and I'll say it again. Muscles help our body move via locomotion, while also aiding in the movement of substances throughout our body. Further, muscle provides support to help us maintain our posture. With this in mind, we rely on many different skeletal muscles without much conscious control to help us maintain an erect or a seated position. These include our trunk muscles in association with our vertebrae, as well as our legs and our shoulders. Third, muscle tissue provides for protection. Think about the muscles of the torso or abdomen that protect the organs of the abdominal cavity, thereby serving in that protective nature. We have our transverse abdominis, our internal obliques, our external obliques. We have our rectus abdominis. Those are all muscles that protect an otherwise vulnerable area of our body. Muscle tissue provides for heat generation and especially skeletal muscle tissue, which releases a considerable amount of heat during the process of contraction. You can also think about this from a negative feedback perspective, such that when we become cold, our skeletal muscles are ultimately targeted to become effectors, shivering to generate more heat. Further, muscle tissue aids in blood circulation, whereby we can consider the cardiac muscle of the heart contracting to pump blood, as well as we can consider smooth muscle of the body that aids in the movement of blood through vessels of the body, thus delivering oxygenated blood to our tissues. Muscles allow us to breathe. We rely on various muscles, including our diaphragm and our other accessory muscles, to passively and actively inhale, as well as to forcibly exhale. We further rely on smooth muscles of our respiratory tree to either increase bronchial size with relaxation or constrict to create smaller airways. Finally, muscles allow us to communicate. We rely on skeletal muscles to help us talk, to gesture, to convey our emotions by doing things such as smiling and frowning. Let's go ahead now and consider each of the three major muscle types of the body. First, we have skeletal muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle is a voluntary muscle, meaning it can contract or relax by conscious control, and it's attached to bone, typically with the help of tendons. In this manner, it aids in locomotion by contracting and relaxing, creating pulley systems in the body to aid in that movement. Skeletal muscle is striated, meaning it has these alternating dark and light bands, which we see here, and those bands are visible under the microscope. We'll learn more about those bands and that light and dark pattern when we consider skeletal muscles later on in the term. Skeletal muscle fibers are long and cylindrical in shape. They have many nuclei located in the periphery of each muscle cell or muscle fiber. And so here are the nuclei. Next, we have cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle is an involuntary muscle tissue, meaning we don't have conscious control over the tissue. It's striated, similar to skeletal muscle tissue, so we have alternating patterns of light and dark. It looks a little different, but we still see striations here if we look closely. And I'm not talking about these structures, but rather if we look carefully, we will see striations along this fiber here, these fibers, etc. Unlike skeletal muscle tissue, however, cardiac tissue fibers are branched most often with one, but sometimes two nuclei per cell. We see nuclei here, and in terms of our branching, we see branching, if we follow this fiber, we'll see branch here and a branch here. 
Now with that branching, the fibers attach end to end by thickenings we call intercalated discs. So we see those discs here, 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 here. And again, what that's doing is we're connecting one fiber to another fiber. And we don't see that with our skeletal muscle. Now those fibers attaching at intercalated discs, those are also the sites of gap junctions. And the gap junctions allow for direct communication between cells. We'll look at cardiac muscle tissue near the end of the second term of anatomy and physiology when we consider the cardiovascular system. Finally, we have smooth muscle, another involuntary muscle, similar to cardiac muscle, being outside our conscious control. Smooth muscle is located in the walls of hollow internal structures such as our blood vessels, the airways to our lungs like our bronchi, the stomach, the small intestine and large intestine, our gallbladder, our urinary bladder. Contraction of smooth muscle helps constrict or narrow a lumen, or helps move food along the digestive tract, or move fluids throughout the body. Smooth muscle, in contrast to skeletal and cardiac, is non-striated. We don't see alternating bands of dark and light stripes. And their shape is also a little different than what we've seen with our other muscle types. They're referred to as being spindle-shaped in nature. If we look at an individual cell here, we're going to see that it's thick in the middle, but we have tapering ends. And each smooth muscle fiber consists of one centrally located nucleus. As it pertains to smooth muscle tissue, we won't have a particular chapter dedicated to its study, but rather we're going to see smooth muscle tissue come up again and again as we consider the various systems of the body, including the respiratory system, circulatory system, digestive system, and reproductive systems. Finally, we move along to nervous tissue, the fourth and final tissue group in the body. Despite the various contributions to our body and several chapters of study during the second term of anatomy and physiology, nervous tissue as a brief introduction is relatively straightforward. First, nervous tissue can be found in three main components. We can find it in the central nervous system where we have the brain and spinal cord, as well as the peripheral nervous system where we find it in nerves. So brain, spinal cord, and nerves are our three main components. Nervous tissue consists of two cell types. First, we have neurons or nerve cells, specialized cells responsible for the generating and conducting of nerve impulses or what we call action potentials. We say neurons are sensitive to stimuli where they convert some kind of stimulus into an action potential, conducting that action potential to the brain where that information can be processed. We also have neuroglia, sometimes simply called glial cells. These are our supporting cells, and their name comes from the idea that early histologists called these the glue that held nervous tissue together. Today, we understand that glial cells are more nuanced. They may not be directly involved in generating or conducting nerve impulses or action potentials, but rather they have various different supporting functions of their own. Here we have two major categories of glial cells for which we have four different types of glial cells in the central nervous system, so that's the brain and spinal cord, and two cell types of the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, we have astrocytes. Astrocytes aid in supporting and bracing neurons, helping ensure neurons receive nutrients and rid themselves of wastes, amongst other activities. We have microglial cells. These are cells responsible for immune function of the central nervous system. Further, we have ependymal cells, cells that are responsible for lining the central cavities of the brain and the spinal cord, and with the help of cilia, aid in the movement of cerebrospinal fluid. And lastly, we have oligodendrocytes. These are supporting cells which wrap themselves, their processes, around nerves, insulating them and ensuring rapid transmission of an action potential. In the peripheral nervous system, we have two glial cell types. First, we have satellite cells. These are supporting cells with functions similar to astrocytes, aiding in physical support of neurons of the peripheral nervous system. And then we have Schwann cells. These are similar in nature to oligodendrocytes, where they form fatty insulating structures around nerves of the peripheral nervous system to help insulate and ensure that rapid transmission of an action potential. When we look at the neuron itself, there are two basic parts of a neuron. We have a cell body and we have cell processes. First, the cell body, sometimes referred to as the soma or the perikaryon. When we look at the cell body, we're looking at this dark purple stained structure right here. And if you're wondering, all of the little dots that are dark purple in the periphery here are glial cells. 
So back to the three major parts of the neuron. First of all, the body, the soma, the perikaryon. The cell body contains the nucleus and all of the organelles of this cell, including mitochondria responsible for the production of ATP. And then we have cell processes, by which there are two types of cell processes. We have our cell processes here, dendrites and axons. First, the dendrite. It's often tapered, highly branched, it's usually short as compared to other types of cell processes of the neuron. They are the major receptive or receiving portion of the neuron, where they receive signals from other neurons and in turn convey that message toward the cell body. We also have the axon. The axon is a long, single, thin, cylindrical process, and it serves as the conducting region of the neuron, transmitting an action potential away from the cell body, away from the soma, and along to another neuron or some other effector, such as a gland, a muscle, or some kind of an organ. So two different parts of which we have the cell body and our processes, we have two different processes. Dendrites, which receive information, axons, which conduct information. Finally, while we've looked at the four types of tissues, epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous, the textbook takes a slight detour right at the end of the chapter to talk about membranes, the coverings and linings of our body. Recall, membranes are flat sheets of pliable tissue that cover or line part of the body. Generally, membranes are composed of an epithelial layer and an underlying connective tissue layer. We've looked briefly at mucous membranes and serous membranes in chapter one of the text, so we'll only cover these briefly in lecture today before moving along to the cutaneous membrane discussion, the membranes covering a body surface. Recall mucous membranes. These membranes align body cavities that open directly to the exterior. They line the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, the reproductive tract, and most of the urinary tract. We also have serous membranes. These are the moist membranes found in our closed ventral cavities. And remember, recall back from chapter one, we have three serous membranes of note. We had the pleural membrane here, which lines the thoracic wall and covers the lungs. We have the pericardial membrane or the pericardium, which encloses the heart within the thoracic cavity. And then we have the peritoneal membrane or peritoneum, which encloses the abdominal pelvic region. As it pertains to serous membranes, don't forget our earlier discussion. These membranes are double layered. We have a parietal layer and visceral layer. The visceral layer covers the organ, because we think of organs as viscera, and the parietal layer lines the body cavity. These membranes also have serous fluid found between the two layers, which serves as a lubricant to reduce friction during organ movement. Lastly, we have cutaneous membranes. Cutaneous membranes cover the body's surface and are sometimes referred to as a dry membrane. These membranes are composed of keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelial tissue attached to a thicker dermal layer. We'll learn more about this when we study the integumentary system, that is the skin, the last week of this term when we consider chapter five. So we're going to skip chapter five for now, and when we return next week, we're going to move along to chapter six. Now with this slide, this is going to conclude the material associated with chapter four. When we return next week, again, we're delving into a new topic in our first system of the body, that is the skeletal system in our study of bones, where we're going to take three weeks to work our way through chapter six through eight of the textbook. If you have any questions, please reach out to me during office hours. And meanwhile, make it a great day.